And I had seen it before. Um, the, the, this this thing is is the um, the image that uh, is known for the labyrinth. And if you look at the center of it, um, and it's the, the legend is it's all at once a labyrinth, a brain, and a pyramid. And so it's my conviction that these are multi-dimensional uh, ideas, signatures, symbols. Uh, about biology and cosmology and astronomy and, and archetypes along the edges here. Well, they're not supposed to, though, Sheriff. Sure. And they're, they're bound by their degree in Egyptology, mm. and uh, it's very, very strict. So when I, I led numbers of groups there, and I would always you have to have the tour guide, the Egyptian tour guide, and I would pay them to be silent. <laughs> because the minute they started talking about all that warring stuff, it just turned my stomach. And, and so it isn't that common that they know. But things like the, the helicopter and the plane at Abydos, they, they tell everybody not to show it, not to point it out. So when I go in there with my group and get everybody behind and point to where it is, they go, how do you know that's there? Right? So, so really, we still live in an age where we're told what to think, and, it, and, and the Egyptian temples speak for themselves. Like if you go and stand, it, because they're accurately replicating the cavities of the human body, and the pyramids are replicating the whole DNA, and then the planet and the solar system and the galaxy is all kind of a mirror in the quantum physics sense. Um, you know, you can have an experience regardless of what anybody's saying. Right, yeah. But if they distract you and say, go look over there, then, then it, 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 it doesn't work the same way. And so, no, it's not common knowledge, and tourism has not recovered. It's at 5% of what it was over the years, and I've been going to Egypt since 1977, and steadily, you know, since uh, 94. And so, it, you know, it used to be where there'd be like 30 buses in the parking lot uh, at the plateau, and, you know, we were the only plane on the tarmac last group I led going to Luxor and back from Aswan and no buses in the parking lot at Saqqara, which is one of the biggest sites. So it's it's not recovering because the mainstream media has done so much about, ooh, it's so scary, 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 but it isn't, you know, and the thing is, is that to me, it's the same old Egypt. It's Egypt, okay. And when you land, they haven't been watching CNN. They don't know that we demonize all things Middle Eastern. Hmm. They don't listen to our media, and so they don't know we're talking really bad about them. And they're happy and extroverted and wear their hearts on their sleeve, and the minute I get there, I'm like, what a relief, because we're not in this machine, even if you don't watch the news, even if you don't participate in that ideology of them, um, it still is, it's still in the collective. And we live inside that. And to me, it's just such a relief to be outside of that headset. Yeah. And that just shows you how much pressure there can be, you know, inside a culture that's trying to get us not to like somebody. Now, if you, if you look at a human being, and this is what I discovered when I was um, researching all these matters, a human being um, essentially corresponds to this architecture that I've described for a Tesla coil. Essentially, we have, um, <clears throat> within the human being, we have the heart circulatory system. And that system is, is of course, a closed system. And through the, the pulsing of the heart, which is an electromagnetic pulsing, it creates a, a kind of a frequency signature, which is essentially the frequency signature of who you are. It is that detailed and, and, and contains you know, that kind of subjective information. That closed heart regulatory system can be an, is analogous to the primary uh, aspect of the Tesla coil circuit. Um, in my understanding, this heart circulatory system um, uh, interfaces inside ourselves with a fundamental polarity of what I've come to understand as, as the head brain and the gut brain, which are connected by very strong nerve centers running up your spine. Now, the, the head and gut, uh, many people probably don't know, but th when you are developing as a fetus in, in your mother's womb, the, the head actually splits off 
from a larger neuronal mass uh, then floats up and becomes the head. The other part, which is the other half of that neuronal mass, it floats down and becomes your intestine. Now the intestine is, is a coiled unit. It's very, very different from the brain, from the head brain. But both are brains. Both are made of neuronal circuitry. Uh, but they are fundamentally opposite in their configuration so that you have this, again, this, this fundamental polarizing going on within the, 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 the brain-gut system, which in my understanding uh, and relating this back to a Tesla coil, corresponds analogously to the secondary open circuit system of the Tesla coil. So it, it, it kind of struck me that, that, wow, you know, the human architecture is this closed open architecture. And, uh, you know, by, by open system, I mean, you know, um, uh, and, and, and these realities are becoming more demonstrated and, and uh, uh, documented as time goes on. But we have, you know, many so-called paranormal effects where, where people, you know, they hear something, they see something internally, they get ideas and visions they can't explain as coming from without, etc., etc. So we seem to be tapped into the rest of the universe by some means, and I think in m my discoveries of, you know, applying, let's say, this Tesla coil analogy to the human architecture, I think I've discovered basically uh, how all that works in, in, in its most general terms. I read that some people claim that Tesla saw the Great Pyramid as a power generator. And they say that he built his tower that generates power from nature using the same engineering principles as the ones used to build the Great Pyramid. Have you considered that this could be nonsense? This is a good question, of course. And I may just know someone who could answer it. Why are there people who believe there is a strong connection between the Great Pyramids and great energy? The film producer and director, Carmen Bolter, made a five-part documentary titled The Pyramid Code, which focuses on the pyramids and other ancient structures in Egypt. I watched this documentary series to search for new information. Nikola Tesla sought to provide the world with free wireless electricity for everybody on Earth. He discovered that electricity occurred naturally throughout the Earth's atmosphere and ground. This energy was not the kind of energy that we have that pollutes. It was a completely um, passive energy that had no byproducts. If the pyramid fields and the network of underground tunnels are still there, why don't they generate energy the way they used to? What did Tesla see in the pyramids other than they are giant tombs? I'd like to ask Carmen this question. Hi, Carmen. Carmen, can you explain to me why do you think the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt were not tombs? It has nothing to do with that. And they keep repeating. They get a story and they repeat it over and over and they get the students to repeat it to get their mark, to get out of, of college. And none of it, they, they have no proof of any of it. They never found a mummy in a pyramid. Why do you think they were power generators? Christopher Dunn has shown how the pyramids could have been used as energy plant. He's written several books, uh, the Giza Power Plant. He's an engineer, and so his research isn't psychic and, you know, esoteric in any way, it's mechanical. And he's done a very good job of showing how energy could have been collected, and that's what part of the weird chemical marks that you see. All the pyramids had an explosion, and maybe all at the same time. And huge cracks are in these stones that are like 300 tons, you know? So how do you crack through the entire stone without this force? And in the Great Pyramid, in the King's Chamber, there's like a crack in the wall, and the side of the sarcophagus is blown right off. And that's like four inches thick of, of pure granite, which is very hard. So if we went in there with sledgehammers and 100 people, we couldn't break it that way. It's funny that you say that because did you know that the word pyromine in Latin means fire in the middle? 
Aha! Did Tesla use ancient Egyptian theories in his work? Is there a similarity between Tesla's towers of wireless energy and the pyramids? Danny Kerr has done a lot of research on the pyramids and energy. He may have some answers. Hi, Danny. How do you think the pyramids generated energy? I went to, to look at the inside of the Great Pyramid and, and try and figure out how it worked. And what I realized was um, there was a gentleman named John Cadman. He's a hydrologist, and he had shown that the Great Pyramid could not be a, like a pulse generator. He showed how the, it created water hammer and could pump water. When I first saw his theory, I realized right away that the granite plugs that are in the start of the ascending passages, that those would move. The pyramids uh, had perimeter walls around them, and I didn't know this before, and it's accepted by Egyptologists, and they say it was to keep thieves out. And what he was saying was it was to keep water in. That was really interesting. And so the water level of the pyramid would be above the uh, ascending passage uh, uh, girdle stones. And so the water would have built up above them. The second you start a pulse inside, it pushes water up. And from there, the pressure increase just did work on the king's chamber. And then once I, um, I just started to investigate how a motor would work that like this, um, with a pressure change inside, came across thermoacoustic engines. Can you now please tell me similarities between Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower and the Giza Pyramids? Apparently, Tesla said his Wardenclyffe Tower, uh, he was using a longitudinal wave, or he was outputting a longitudinal electric wave. And technically, it's not possible. No one's figured that out. In the pyramids, they're producing loud vibrations that mix to produce longitudinal waves. It's very similar. Also, the pyramids in Egypt and the Wardenclyffe Tower are both built on aquifers. Uh, with the Wardenclyffe Tower, the water was there to aid the grounding. He was transmitting through ground, and the water lowered the resistance in the ground and made it a conductor. The pyramids, that's also the case. Not only are they water powered, they are built above an aquifer, and they had, uh, they were sat in pools, we think. Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower was low frequency. So was the Great Pyramid. That's another similarity. Both have the capability to transmit worldwide. It seems that there can be a similarity in principles between the energy tower built by Tesla and the Great Pyramids built by ancient Egyptians. Could this be a coincidence? And why has there been no one until today who tried using this technology? These are questions that require another journey to search for answers. Energy is simply power. That's why I see the most important structures today are not palaces or skyscrapers or cemeteries. I think structures like dams, oil rigs and nuclear power plants are the most important. Because these are the factories of energy, hence power. Yet when we look at the Great Pyramids of Giza, are we supposed to think they were no more than giant tombs? If financing Tesla hadn't stopped, he could have succeeded in providing the world with clean energy at low cost. Does that mean Tesla could have changed the world?